And so I was very, very happy when UX started to mature around me. Um, and I guess maybe six or seven years ago, uh, at least in my in my memory, it started to really gel and become something. So uh, uh, I'll get into, uh, get into more details about that in a little while. Um, that's my just my name and my Twitter up there. Um, in case you want to follow up with any questions later on, it's probably the best way to reach me. Uh, so on with the show. Scrum, Agile? Why, why is there a question mark? Um, so, you all are, are likely, well, oh, first I should say, how many folks are here for the Scrum Agile uh, group? Okay, most of you, and, and a few folks here for the UX UI group, right? Okay, all right. And um, other folks who just wandered in because they didn't want to get wet, we uh, <laughs> were in park. <laughs> Free food. Um, Free food, right. Uh, so that's helpful to know. So uh, I'm not a Scrum or Agile expert. I'm more of a UX expert, right? Um, thinking of ways to incorporate UX into your, uh, you know, into your project. That is not what really what I'm going to be covering tonight. Um, you know, I've read about incorporating it into, you know, uh, Sprint Zero or including UX one sprint ahead. So you're basically doing all your UXing two weeks ahead of the actual development work. Um, I've also heard that that's kind of a transitional approach. And you don't really want to be there in the end. You want to start to pepper it in all throughout, right? Um, which, if you think UX is kind of this big, expensive, scary thing, that can be a daunting thought to try and pepper it throughout. So my goal here tonight is to try and communicate that actually, no, it's not this big and scary thing. There are ways to do it in bite-sized pieces. There are ways to do it quickly. Uh, there are ways to do it cheaply. There are ways to do it free. Um, and so these are some things that hopefully you can walk out of here tonight feeling armed with uh, you know, some of these techniques. Um, first, the Webster's definition of, uh, it's not in Webster, but uh, user experience or UX, I guess I'll look this way. The process, okay, first of all, I realize it shouldn't be UX, it should be UE, um, but for whatever reason, UX is what caught on, so that's what we call it, so people are running around saying UX. Uh, it's the process of enhancing user satisfaction with a product by improving the usability, accessibility, leisure. You know, God forbid it should be a pleasurable experience to use a product, right? Um, Providing an interaction with the product, right? So, great, we've got this kind of broad definition. I think it's helpful, but there's kind of an element of so what to this definition. Uh, so, I figured I'd pull out a few real-world examples, all right? Um, Mother's Day was not so long ago, so hi, Mom, happy Mother's Day. Uh, how does, how does uh, this, these ideas of UX, how do they kind of pepper into your everyday life? Well, think in terms of uh, user flows, right? The checkout flow. Um, you're a customer, you're buying something. It could be online, it could be in real life. At Baja Fresh, you could be physically there. Um, you know, and maybe you're, you're waiting for your chicken quesadilla and you get this message up on the wall. Um, it makes the customer, hopefully makes the customer feel happy. Maybe a little. Um, it's also good for the brand. Uh, they probably did research and took some time to understand that, hey, people are starting to get really engaged and wait for their stuff. They thought it was like Taco Bell, and it would be out really quick, and it's not. So let's put the sign up here. And clearly, it makes people happy, right? Whenever you see workarounds, see them as opportunities, right? Um, 
This kind of reminds me of what's been happening in Cupertino at Apple Zoo office, where people have been walking into the glass walls. Um, the call to minimalism, which is a presentation for another day. But uh, yeah, I don't know the full story here of why this door had to be labeled door, but uh, UX is part of sort of spotting things that need to change, spotting iterations. Um, another one, this is kind of a more, a more uh, famous, I guess, example of UX. This is one, one I happen to see personally. So I thought I was the only one to cut through that parking lot and squeezing in between these two things to go and get to my train. But those are not my footprints, so somebody else was doing it. But the point is, are you, are you paying attention to all of your sources of data? Um, data is everywhere. When you go up and you look at that train platform and you see that nobody's there, that's kind of like data. Anyway, but the point is, make sure you're um, you know, turning over every potential source of data, make sure that you're trying to understand what people really are doing, Right? Not what they say they're doing, not what they're supposed to be doing, not what you assume that they're doing. It's going to help your business. And then finally, this, okay. When the library is open, the book drop is closed. Please come in and say hello. Uh, using using a really empathetic but effective techniques to control or nudge the behaviors of, of your users, um, which ends up being good for them, potentially, right? And also being good for your business. These are just ways that UX kind of peppers into everyday life. Again, uh, UX, you know, everybody likes to sound smart, so UXers like to talk about prototypes and research and kind of throwing around words that kind of sound intellectual and sound expensive, right? Um, but that also sometimes has the effect of, of making business stakeholders kind of worry that, hey, no, we don't have time for this. We don't have a budget for this. Um, meanwhile, we, we, just want, we just want to know our, our users better. Um, it doesn't have to be big. It doesn't have to be scary. You don't have to have a lab somewhere in the building with, a, with a, you know, one of those mirrors that they have in the police shows. You don't need all that. Um, especially now, there's so many tools out there. Okay, so I guess that's kind of the broad intro. That's kind of the broad sweeping strokes, right? Um, and now to, to sort of drill down into a, a, different, a different sort of uh, line of thinking. Um, very, very often, these two terms are sort of spoken about as if they're kind of the same thing, right? Um, and just in case you know, UX, obviously user experience, UI, user interface design, right? Or user interface. Um, they're very closely related, and historically, they did branch out from kind of the same part of product design. But there's a very, very specific relationship here. And I'll illustrate this in a minute, but just if you think of uh, CX as a customer experience, right? If you think of uh, that as kind of being the broadest way that your customers sort of interact with your product or your company, um, UX would then be just the product. Um, and I don't have to keep talking about this because it's on the board. And then, of course, UI is a subset of UX, right? Um, in that order. Again, so uh, it's a it's a Venn diagram. I'd rather illustrate this a little bit better. Um, go to Roosevelt Field Mall and find somebody. Don't really, but imagine you're going to ask them a question. You say, well, if I start talking about light switch design, this notion of light switch design, is that word design? You all know what design is. What will most people think of? Well, Google has the answer, right? 
Uh, I would I would say, and myself included, before I put this together, you know, we see these words up here: decorative, <laughs> modern, contemporary, cute, trendy. On down the line, what do, what does the light switch look like, right? What are the colors? What are the styles? Maybe there's a like a dimmer or a slider. Yeah, that's all part of it. Um, but if that's your definition of design, it's it's there's so much more to it. And in order to fully illustrate that, I think it, it pays to think about when was a light switch an innovation? When was a light switch a new thing? What was life like before the light switch? And the reason why I love this photo, this fixture in the middle. Um, so the people that you're looking at in that photo, it was around the turn of the century. Um, their entire lives, they've been lighting their houses with gas lights, right? Maybe some candles, but you know, most people for, for about the century leading up to that, it was all uh, interior gas lighting, right? So folks would, for the most part, they'd walk into the center of the room, they would light a match, maybe stand up on a stool, they would light their gas lamp. So, what are we seeing here? Now we've got this, this incredible new technology, this electricity, it's kind of revolutionizing everything. Um, what, did, what did people do? Well, first of all, they took the existing light that was already in the room and they outfitted it with some light bulbs that you can see here. This is, this is your gas lamp, which at this point is uh, not being used. And here's the switch, do you see it? So folks would still, you see what's going on? It's, it's like you've got this behavior that you've been doing your whole life. You've got this new technology, but you're kind of saying, well, I'm going to keep on doing the same thing that I did before. I'm going to keep walking into the center of this dark room, and maybe I'm going to stub my toe on my Victorian furniture, and I'm going to figure out how to light this lamp. But it was still better than what you had before. If you had a UX mind or a designer's mind um, or just an inquisitive mind, you just might start to think, well, we've got this new technology. This might be an opportunity to really change things even more. Um, what would be magical here? What would be even more magical than having electric light? Well, what if maybe you were unsure, so you start observing people? You start to get a sense of, of, of what they're doing, where they're stuck in their toe, etc. And finally, you realize, you know, maybe we can experiment with this idea. We can do a sh create this very cheap uh, method of turning the light on right when you walk into the room. So there's your prototype. And then, of course, that kind of picked up steam until you get the light switch, right? It's, the, the technology happens first, and only later do we realize the implications of it on our own behavior. So when we're thinking today of, of uh, you know, uh, the echo dot and interacting with voice, we're kind of talking to it the same way we would Google search something, or we're kind of doing it in familiar ways, but what are, what are some other ways that we haven't thought of yet to kind of push this technology? Um, Now I'm going to ask you, when you think of light switch design, I hope it's clear that it's, it's so much more than what it looks like. It's so much more than the styles and the things that you can touch. It's, it's the magic behind it. It's all the thinking behind it and all of the things that have led to where it is now. Um, and all of these things are kind of unlocked by, by UX techniques. Um, and by the way, I like the faces because it's uh, if you consider a UI user interface, there are your faces. Get it? Uh -huh. um, but uh, it's still important. It's still it's still uh, a worthy thing to work on. But it's just part of it, right? So at this point. Um, 
probably worth getting into some real examples. Um, and my hope is, like, I'm, I'm just using an example that I happen to experience in my own career. Um, I'm going to show you some techniques. Know that you can pull any of this, these techniques. You can change the order of them. You can use them in ways that suit your products, um, to suit your goals. What's the news about? Okay, so it's 2016. Um, Chatbots were kind of hot, they were kind of new. And um, I was working in a technology media company uh, right over in the city. And I, I should point out, um, there are there are discovery research techniques that you can do upstream. In this case, uh, some of the business stakeholders had already gotten the idea that, hey, maybe if we leverage all of our news outlet connections and we created a chatbot, maybe that might be good for our business. Um, so that those conversations have already been had. So I'm starting off this example a little bit a little bit downstream, right? Um, so where do you start? You're looking into this wall of fog. It's kind of a new technology. There aren't that many examples out there. Um, but are there any examples out there? So that's where we started. We started to ask the question, well, what else is out there that's kind of similar to what we're doing? And we discovered that there were some early news bots out there. They didn't nearly do what we were hoping to do, but there were certain things out there, certain similar experiences. So right away, you're getting into competitor research, or, I don't know, complementary research. But looking at what else is out there, there's nothing wrong with starting there. You're not stealing from them. Like you go, you go out there and you see what they're doing and you use this to inform what you're working on. You catalog it, you make, you make notes, right? You understand what's going on. And then um, the next thing you want to talk about is surveys. You have no excuse not to be surveying people because the tools are free. Um, we've all got social accounts. You can reach out to folks. You don't have to go stand in the mall with a clipboard anymore. You can, you can uh, get this done. And so, without knowing what was going on, you know, without knowing how people were really using this, we sat in a room and we speculated. And we thought, well, I think I would use it this way. But, you know, we're not designing for ourselves here. We're designing for other people. So, with zero budget and like two days to figure this out, um, set up a survey, survey people in the company, and we asked them relevant questions. Are you using these chatbots? Are you not? A very small number, number of people said yes. So that was just a very quick, dirty way to quickly recruit people. And immediately after that, we started to interview some of them, especially the ones who were physically there. A couple of them were remote. Um, this is Joe's hand. And I remember, and again, this is free, other than people's time. You start just talking to people who are most convenient, close to you, if you don't have any other opportunities. Um, so I think we did five or six different user interviews. And um, I remember a young guy, he worked with me, he was an intern, really smart guy. And he, he pulled me aside before the first interview and he said, well, wait a minute, you know, we sat in the room and we kind of figured this out. Don't be really know. And I looked at him and I said, well, maybe, maybe we got, maybe we already know, that's true. I said, well, let's, let's just interview a few folks just to find out. Um, and immediately Joe took out his phone and we started asking how we used the CNN chatbot. And he started to access it through the online browser, started to access it through the mobile browser instead of through the app. And we were like, oh, okay, that was way, way different than what we thought. Not significant, but fundamental uh, anyway, right? And so we were happy that we interviewed. Um, 
I'll keep a running tally of the techniques on the screen. Um, what's the problem with this, with this research? There, there, there are multiple issues with this. Does anybody, can anyone take a gander? What questions do you have? Well, yeah, I don't remember what the exact, yeah, we, we asked. You could bias it by asking certain questions and uh, not really getting the user's point of view because you box them in. So, in case you didn't hear what he said, he said you could bias your users by asking the wrong questions. Um, if you say, what does this button do? Now, guess what? You're, you bias them because now they're looking at the button. Um, absolutely right. There's a risk of biasing. So, the questions that you ask, have to be very, very carefully thought out and asked in a particular order. Um, I would say some other, some other problems here are, first of all, the app is meant to reach the general population, right? And we're just asking the people who sit around us. That's a biased method of recruiting. So why did we do it? We did it because it was better than not. All right? Um, and that's a way to start. The other problem is when you interview somebody, and I think this goes hand in hand with the bias issue, is that you start to get kind of these broad general statements. This is what I usually do, but do they really usually do that? Are they remembering it wrong? So our next step was to get more granular. Um, a diary study is typically uh, seven days long or you know, multiples of seven, so you get a full week in there. Uh, it's not always on Facebook Messenger. We chose, I chose to do it on Facebook Messenger because folks were already in there. So in other words, uh, the remaining survey respondents that I had been recruited, I said to them, hey, do you, do you mind checking in like you're using this thing all week long? Immediately after you're done using it, would you mind flipping over, flipping me a message and saying, "Hey, what were the circumstances? Did you uh, conduct any searches through the, through the platform? What are, what are some granular details about your usage?" Um, and you can do that with any existing product. You can ask folks to check in immediately after they're done using it. Uh, that way. You're getting really good granular, granular information. Um, so that's the doctor stuff. I'll mention that uh, personas are another part of it. Um, I'm not going to get too into detail here, but essentially we create personas to remind ourselves that we're not designing for us, right? We're designing for this other fictional person, and maybe they don't do things the way you do it, right? Maybe it's a single mom with a screaming baby and they are not sleeping at night, right? You can imagine all kinds of other scenarios. Um, otherwise, the tendency is for you to forget about that person and to just start designing for you. And when you've got the developer team, you've got product managers, you've got all these other different folks, you can very easily lose focus, you can start designing for the, whoever's the loudest person in the room, right, whoever's the highest ranking person in the room, what's their personal preference, you, you, you start to, unless you guard against that, you start to kind of fall into that rut. Um, so we create these people. Um, why don't you use a real person? I keep talking about shopping malls tonight, I don't know why, but if you went to the shopping mall and you went to look for that average person, the average person doesn't actually exist, right? So you need to kind of create this uh, stereotypical user. It's a little bit strange, and if you do it wrong, there, you know, you can, you can lose credibility, so it needs to be communicated very carefully. Uh, when it's done right, uh, it can really be helpful. And I remember for this project, I went, I went off on an international business trip. I printed out a couple of these personas, and I was going to give them to the uh, development team. And when I got there, they had already printed them out. They were up on the wall. And I was like, oh, 
yes, like they're into it. It's, it, it worked, like they're, they're on board. Um, and I heard a couple of them mention, mention the personas by name, so that, that was really helpful. Um, but yeah, at this point in our process, back to the news bot, uh, we were still kind of in draft mode on the personas because we, we still had a lot to learn. Because remember, we haven't spoken to anybody externally yet. Um, which brings me to the next section in this particular project. So we started out knowing very little other than what the business stakeholders wanted. We surveyed some folks locally and we leveraged some of their experiences. Great. You could very easily look at that and say, well, you're spinning your wheels. You're only talking to people inside your own walls. I mean, it's free and you didn't spend any money yet. That's great. But it doesn't really carry any more. At best, it gives you some basic sketch of what your product should look like. And you know what? That's on. You're still early enough where you can start taking these general basic understandings and testing them out. Um, and I'm sure, I'm sure you know the word prototype. That's exactly what this is, right? Some prototypes are uh, just drawn on paper. Other prototypes like this one were mocked up a little bit more and created a, this one was created in a tool called Sketch, design tool called Sketch. And it was exported and turned into like a clickable, just a simple clickable prototype in a tool called InVision. Right, spell just the way it's out. And the reason we did that is because we still didn't know enough. We weren't going to start wasting our budget on the developers who were very expensive and they were busy anyway. Um, we needed to we needed to learn a little bit more first. So what did we do? I'm gonna just, I'm going to attempt to play a video, which is always risky during presentation. Okay, so we're going to imagine that you're exploring news articles on your mobile phone. This is a uh, unmoderated task-based user test using the prototype we built. If you're doing Usability testing, it doesn't have to be unmoderated. You can sit in a room with somebody. Uh, there are all different ways to conduct it. Um, this is the way we chose. All right, so we're gonna scroll down. And we see four photos. Well, it looks like it's the end of a news article and then there's other things that I'm assuming they might think you wanna know about. They're varied because um, it looks like there's CNN, um, Vanity Fair, the Food Network, and Wired. So, so we're going to look at the button that says chat. These are the tasks that are planned in advance. Um, now, what's wrong with this? We're saying to people, oh, by the way, the participants now are external. They're kind of just general folks from around the country. So we've, we've exited our cocoon. Um, and they're getting tasks. Uh, this is a tool called Validate. Okay, Validate. L. Um, we're drawing her attention to the button specifically, which is a big no-no. Unless her missing the button would completely invalidate the whole test and we wouldn't learn anything post-button click. We had to ask her some preliminary questions and then we had to show her the button. Um, it was more setting context than anything else. Um, ordinarily though, don't point out specific elements. With outbrain. Okay, I'm not really sure what that means. Unless you really know what that program is, I would assume it's going into um, some sort of live chat. See where that takes us. So what's outbrain for chat? Amelia's outbrain is bot. That brings you news and personalized for you. Just 
I think it's kind of interesting to be able to have this program kind of personalize everything for you as far as the news and what you like. And that's one thing we learned a lot is that, so we ended up speaking to 25 different people overall in sets of five, right? And why did we do it that way? Why didn't we talk to 25 people all at once? Because first of all, you're not looking for statistical significance yet. This would be an awfully inefficient way to try and achieve statistical significance. Um, instead, we wanted to talk to five people, um, learn what patterns were there. In other words, if three out of the five people thought something, then there's a good chance that you should go and fix it. Um, if you start doing more than five, more than seven, you start getting repetitive information and it's not very helpful. Uh, on the other hand, if you do fewer than five, you might get three people who have three very different viewpoints. Um, th th there's a greater risk of you, know, you acting on someone who's an outlier. So five is the magic number. Um, and then you can use your limited budget to iterate, make fixes, and then test it with five more. Right. All right. So I'm going to say send to Messenger. Okay. I'm going to click on what's at the top of the screen. Looks like there is an article on Trump. And then I assume you could scroll over to the side and then you'll see um, what is else is there. Looks like there's a couple things on the bottom as far as what's trending. Let's see, if you click on summary, gives you a quick summary of what the article is supposed to be. How would you look at the most popular? Okay, you get the point. She's going through and trying out what we think the experience should be. And, you know, we didn't expect for her to have any problems at all. Well, it turns out there were a couple of issues there, and we realized, oh, wait a minute, after five people, we were like, oh, yep, we've got a couple of things that, that we need to fix. Aren't you glad you didn't start getting the developers involved yet? You can just go to your sketch design and fix it, like, in five seconds, you know? No. Attempt to seamlessly get back. techniques and they're all kind of happening in succession and they were kind of mixing together you know the survey was more quantitative the interviews were more qualitative the diary study was kind of a mix um, although nothing nothing has really been statistically significant yet we're still getting various different forms of data from various sources and you know if the truth is somewhere here in the middle we're kind of spiraling around it, trying to get closer and closer to that ideal product, right? And we're learning, we're learning more each time. Or if you like the, the, the lug nuts uh, analogy, you're tightening each lug nut a little bit as you go, finally you've got your, your tire. Um, we, we've also talked about iteration a little bit. Oh, MVP. Uh, minimum viable product. Uh, so after our first or second round of usability testing, now the developers had started putting stuff out there. So we were able to start testing the actual experience, which was nice. We were able to learn a whole new, uh, whole new set of things uh, by by testing with the, the actual technology. Right. So that's the idea, that's the idea of the MVP, minimum viable. Product which, you know, started off with a, with a humble prototype. And that's what it looked like. Um, I 
not scary in the video, it's a chatbot. But uh, unless you want to see it. Sure, go ahead. Sure, I heard someone said, sure, go ahead. Why not? You might as well see what the thing looked like. people actually like? I hear successful implementation. A product people use. A product people use. Someone else say something? User experience. Well, actually, as a result of all this, we learned that the product wasn't going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay, too, because now we knew we knew that people didn't quite recognize the brand. It just, it just wasn't going to work. And we could point to data to say, no, 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 let's not do this. Let's move on. Let's, let's do something else. Uh, but this was an innovative product. I'm like that's okay. It was kind of designed for us to learn that. Don't like. I know different cultures are are are, are um, different with this, but. If 
you can find a way to let the data in and really guide your decisions, even if the decision is, you know, that's good for your business too. So, just the way it happened. Go. It was a success because you came to a good conclusion. You had hard data, and you knew that you didn't want to go up that path, and you wanted to try something else. So, actually, it was successful. I agree. Yeah. 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 She said, actually, it is successful because you've got, you've got the hard data, and you've got, like, you know this is not going to work. I don't know, I, I wish you, you said it so much better than I did, but. Yeah, I was, that was right on. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, I might skip the activity. Do, how are we on time? Uh, ten minutes. Ten minutes left. Perfect, okay. Um, I was going to invite you to take a, a survey. Um, I'll skip it because I've got 10 minutes left. And I'll move on to the next case study. And this will, be, this will be a quick one. This isn't going to be as long as the other one. Don't worry. Tag in late. Um, so that was an innovation track, right? This was like this crazy experimental product that you could kind of it could fail, and the business would be okay. If it succeeded, it would be great, but if it failed, we were still okay. This product that I'm about to talk about was the core revenue driver of the company. So I just want to drive the point home that this isn't just for these experiments. These, this isn't just for innovation labs, right? Um, you can use some of these techniques some of your most important products, right? Um, that's our problem. Uh, I pointed this out because also all of this, all of the examples I'm showing you are have taken place in the real world, right? Um, it's it's nice to do things, you know, in a, in a classroom setting, and you do learn a lot. But once you get out and start taking on the real world, you have to, you know, there, there are other, other things you have to tackle. And in this particular company, same company, technology media company, uh, I was hired again to be a visual designer there. So started working on this dashboard and it was really important. And we had to get out lots and lots of new features because we had to keep up with the competition, right? Uh, I'm betting this might sound familiar to some of you, right? Uh, we've got to, uh, you can't blink, you can't stop innovating. But how do you prioritize? How do you really know? How do you know that you're focusing on this right feature at this right moment? Um, UX, right? And I started to realize working here as a, as a visual designer that there was really nobody uh, conducting UX research. So they don't know me, I'm new. I'm like, they don't know me from all of them all. Um, so what do you do in that situation? You're going to march right into the boss and be like, I need, I need to talk to all our most important clients. No, you're not going to do that because that would be crazy. Um, what I started to do was to just, you know, be friendly with people in the coffee room. You figure out what people do. You sort of get your bearings at this new company. You start to figure out who's working directly with the customer, right? Um, and I thought, oh, well, maybe that's the right person to start talking to. Because they know a lot more than I do. And even the other designers on my team who have been in the company for a while. The customer service person is going to know more than those designers, probably, because they're doing it directly. So started to use the design tools and generate prototypes. And uh, so the first usability tests were with the customer service people. One in particular who I made friends with I was like, hey, um, you know, I'm working on this thing. Can you maybe come and check it out? And every designer does that, right? Can you come and check out what I'm working on? The difference was uh, I was reading Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug at the time. And I realized, well, instead of doing this informally, 
I can conduct usability tests that are task-based, that are structured in the correct way, that are not biased, right? Because if you say the wrong thing, it's like a poker game. If you reveal that they're clicking on the right, you know, the right button, you're biased to your users. So I said, let, let me try this out. Um, well, it worked. I was like, oh my god, this worked. Like, I actually learned something about the product. Uh, hey, friend, do you know anybody else on your team that might want to do this? To my surprise, they said, yeah, you know, to talk to Sarah. Sarah would love having this conversation with you. And that's one thing that, I was, that I'm surprised by. People are delighted to come and have these conversations because now they have, they're, they're, they're being part of the process, they enjoy it. So I was like, okay, I'll talk to Sarah. And then before I knew it, I had five or six of these interviews under my belt. So you're not looking at the world. So what you think? Okay. And then before long, it started to pick up steam. Before long, these customer service folks these, and these account managers started to say, hey, we're going to have a meeting externally with XYZ agency. Do you want to come along and show them the product and do one of your tests? And I said, yeah, absolutely. So it sort of grew organically, and that's, you know, again, in the real world, it can be difficult to gain access to some of your most important clients, but uh, it happens. We're able to figure out a way to make it work. And over time, let's see, what's our next slide here? That, not that. <laughs> Oh, this is an example that I'll talk about in a minute. Oh, I might as well talk about it now. So, so um, what were some of the results of these usability tests over the years, right? Um, this is where the visual design comes in. Do you see this button? Look at how cool that is. You've got this plus button. And if you tap the plus button, you then go in and you add your, uh, your advertisement. This was our equivalent of the add to cart button. Right? Critical to business. Very, very talented visual designer created this thing, and we all on the design team loved it. We said, well, let's test it out first. Among other things, we tested it out. Um, I spoke to seven different people on this one, and all task based. At a certain point, I said, Okay, now you're at the point of the process where if you would please go ahead and add your content. Everyone. Uh, I don't know, I can't find it. Now, if only one person couldn't find it, you'd be like, ah, come on. Nobody could find it. So aren't we glad we tested it? And, and again, this was one of those quick, you know, quick designs. This never made it into code. So eventually. You know, and designers know that if you make something big and you make it red, that it will be seen. And well, as much as that irks the visual designer in me to go ahead and take that route, that's what we did, and it worked well. Um, so that was the second example. I told you to be shorter. Um, but just to show that in that instance, we had a much more conventional success story in that we were able to churn out dozens and dozens of new features, right? Uh, in a relatively short amount of time, we were able to prioritize, um, and the product is successful even to this day. So, that's all I got. As you can see up here, if, you have, if you're a member of one but not the other, consider joining the other. Um, Mike approached me in the gym one morning in the building here and said, hey, do you want to do this talk? And I said, sure. So Mike, thanks for the opportunity. Thank you. Andrew.
Nice to be in the bush. <laughs> so, Mike, just one thing before I, we open it up for questions. For someone who says who doesn't know anything about Agile and Scrum, these are probably the basic principles of Agile and Scrum. User uh, doing uh, the design based on personas, the, like user stories as a blank that want to do this. So persona based empathy mapping. Uh, the learn fast so you can fail fast and, the, and adapt. All of these things are basic agile principles. So I think you know a little bit more about agile than you give yourself credit. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So I'm going to open it up for questions. Who wants to go first? Uh, We've been talking about usability tests and also um, how to use it in the business and also how to gather um, information from the customer service, right? So one thing I was trying to get a handle on is how, uh, how the customer service people assist in the UX process by you know, asking, like in case, in this case, uh, our persona might be feelings. Um, do, you, do the customer service people ask the dealers what isn't working right? Or, you know, what, and, are, and without considering buttons or anything like that, when you come to the screen, what is it that you want to see next? Or, I mean, and that you're not seeing now? I mean, how is that usability tested with customers? Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. So, I don't want to read your questions again, Mike. Um, if you're working, so, so, first of all, I would say, it's difficult to talk, it's difficult for the UX people sometimes to speak directly with the customers, right? Um, and if you talk to anybody who works as a UX researcher, that is a significant part of the job is recruitment, right? And if you're, imagine if you have some, if you're working on some product aimed at uh, heart surgeons, you know, how do, how do you get in front of heart surgeons? Very difficult. There are all different ways. Sometimes a, a monetary incentive is appropriate. Other times, this is where surveys come in. Right, right, exactly. And I would say there, right, surveys. Um, there are customer feedback collection devices that in most companies are already set up. And in those cases, you do get some sense of, you know, Nobody's going to go in and out of their way to leave a neutral comment, right? It could be morally positive or completely negative. Right, <laughs> completely positive because they're just being nice or completely negative. So you're getting the two extremes. It might help you to understand where you want to improve, but it's not the best source of information. It's better than nothing. It's better than nothing, but it's not the best source of this type of usability information. Um, and I would say, you asked about working through a customer service. Yeah, I would say maybe if they're trained somehow in the UX process so that they can ask the right questions of their uh, customers. Uh, I mean, it, it might be possible. Um, from what I've seen, it's more that the customer service professional or a channel manager will make the introductions and then the UX researcher will actually be the one to ask the questions. Um, because if I'm, even if I'm a trainer, I'm, a, I'm an account, you know, I'm an account manager, I'm a customer service person, I'm a trainer. I'm coming into that room with all kinds of <coughs> other motives for speaking to the person. Maybe I want to show the new feature a lot, and I want to inform them of, of <clears throat> how to use the product. Um, I would leave it to someone who's dedicated to research um, to actually go and ask those questions because they've been trained. 
they've been trained to really keep their poker face, right? Um, and so, I don't know, I hope that, I hope that, that yeah. begins to address your question. Uh, any other questions? <clears throat> I don't think I need the mic. Though. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, thanks, Mike, appreciate it. Uh, you, you started the conversation earlier this evening about when UX is introduced into the process. And you didn't get too far into it and made some mention about uh, anti-patterns and then some goals. How are you today in, in a where you want to be introducing UX practices into the process? Just spend a few minutes talking about that. Absolutely. Um, so I started a little bit downstream on purpose because that's probably the easiest place to start. Um, if you want to start at, you know, when, when there's a completely blank slate, um, in my experience, for the most part, there are some other folks doing that that are elsewhere in the business. However, um, well, let me take a step back. Okay, if you start at the end, you can start winning over some, some critical lines. If you start usability testing, you are almost at the end of the process, but you can start showing success there. At least that's how it worked with, with uh, you know, my experience. And then start to slowly go upstream. Um, if you're talking about doing discovery at the very, very beginning, which is going to be a little more rare, and oftentimes, you know, that's a job for consultants, for you know, a real specialist. Um, there are workshops that you can conduct, card sorting, ways to sort of corral what people want. I mean, you have to have some business idea to begin with that you're testing. Um, but you can really do a lot with these techniques, with, even when you have almost a blank slate, right? Um, yeah, I, mean, I would look at uh, um, card sorting exercises, I would look at uh, usability workshops. It's kind of uh, categorized under discovery research. Um, I touched on a little bit here, but that's a whole, like, it, it starts to get a little bit more ethereal once you start getting that far upstream, because there's nothing really there yet. So it's just, it was a little, it's a little bit harder to kind of show examples of that. That's why I kind of avoided that for tonight. But uh, I hope I've given you enough like, little things to kind of dig into. Any more questions? Yeah, I have a Yeah, I get to win, right? I win. <laughs> <laughs> Put this on top.